This article starts out... 500 years ago, the Aztec civilization in today's Mexico believed that the sun and all its power was sustained by blood from human sacrifice. Today, we know the sun, along with all other stars, is powered by a reaction called nuclear fusion. It's, a, it's quite the opening statement, right? Hello, everyone, and welcome to the first episode of the third season of In Plain English. I am your host, Jamie Moffa, and today we're going to be talking about nuclear fusion, specifically going over the papers um, Magnetic Confinement Fusion, a Brief Review by Shan Jun Wang and Lai Feng Li, and also talking about the article What is Fusion and Why Is It So Difficult to Achieve by Irina Chattis and Matteo Barbarino. I am joined by our expert, Daniel Mulrow. Uh, Daniel, welcome to the podcast. Great. Thanks, Jamie. I'm very excited to be here. Uh, do you want to tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Sure. So let's see. My background is I got a PhD in uh, nuclear chemistry from Washington University in St. Louis. Um, and so my dissertation was actually more related to the effects of ionization density, which is really just when radiation passes through something, it has the ability to ionize the substance. The ionization density is the ionization over a given path length. So that ionization density in various materials for applications in uh, radiation detection and therapy. And so over the past couple of years, I've also been working for the NNSA and the National Academies of Science. Um, so I've gotten to learn a little bit more about different types of fusion just through that kind of work. Very excited to talk about it with you all today. Yeah, very cool. I'm very excited to learn more about this topic. And our guest for this episode is Ryan Perez. Ryan, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Ryan Perez. Um, I work in internal audit and risk management in a local feed agricultural business. Um, my educational background is I have a master's degree in industrial organizational psychology. And my research background is mostly in veterans issues. Uh, my thesis was on um, how veteran status impacted uh, job applicants' ability to get hired on jobs and perceptions um, of job applicants that were veterans. Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And without further ado, um, I'll hand it over to Daniel so we can talk about the papers. Okay, great. Yeah, the, the paper and the article that I chose today. So um, we'll start with the paper. <laughs> we chose a um, review article uh, called Magnetic Confinement Fusion, a Brief Review. And so a review is really just an overview of the current published literature. So as you saw in this current article, it really gave a wide breadth of what is going on specifically in magnetic confinement fusion. And so when I say that, um, I just wanted to emphasize that because there are really two experimental uh, ways that we can create fusion. That's magnetic confinement fusion, such as in the uh, ITER, which we'll be talking about. And then there's also inertial confinement fusion, which you guys may have heard about um, with respect to the National Ignition Facility um, at Lawrence Livermore National Lab. They recently published results of reaching ignition, which we'll also probably talk about um, a little bit more. And so because we wanted to focus on ITER, uh, we needed to understand magnetic confinement fusion. This really just went over the history of and some of the basic principles of how to achieve fusion in the lab. So I'll pause there. Do you guys have any initial questions? I'm, a, I'm assuming we're about to kind of go over how the whole magnetic confinement system works and maybe an overview of like, it, it may seem obvious, but like why that's necessary. <laughs> yes. So... Stepping through the paper to start with, uh, we start with the principles of fusion, right? So one of the first things is we want to produce energy. And so fusion is one way that we can take small elements or, you know, nuclei. We're actually going to talk about it in terms of nuclei. We're going to merge those nuclei. And because of something called binding energy, it turns out that every single nucleus contains energy within it, right? And so when you put all of these very close together, so like in the sun, naturally, we have a very high temperature and high pressure environment that's merging all of these low 
atomic number elements and isotopes together. So an isotope is essentially going to be within the same element. You can have different numbers of neutrons associated with the number of protons. So num number of protons gives you the element. The number of neutrons gives you the isotope within that element. And so we're really concerned about three isotopes of hydrogen. There's the proton, which is what we call hydrogen. There's a proton plus a neutron, that's a deuterium. And there's a proton plus two neutrons, and that's tritium or a triton, sometimes as it's referred to. What happens is when you typically, if you just had these all kind of hanging out, the electromagnetic force between all these positive charges would actually repel them from one another. But in these different systems, we're going to find a way to push them very close together, and then a reaction can occur. So fusion occurs because when you actually get them close enough together, there's something called the nuclear force, the strong nuclear force. And it's going to actually overcome the electromagnetic force. And it's going to bind them together. And these low elements, these low atomic number elements, when they combine, they actually release energy. So it's favorable to do this. And that's how we end up having elements that are heavier than hydrogen and helium, is that they, they do this. And so that's the principle behind fusion. But as I said, you have to be able to force them very close together, um, creating what we call high energy density states. And so one of the ways is magnetic confinement. In this review, it kind of goes over the different ways that magnetic confinement came about. And so one of the first ways was creating a mirror chamber. So it's a big cylinder that they basically pulsed um, these different isotopes of hydrogen and it would reflect on the different ends of this cylinder. Basically, you can find everything with a magnetic force. And so how does that work? Well, the Lorentz force basically is a basically how a charged particle acts in an electric and magnetic field. And so you're utilizing the fact that it's going to spin around in this a helix, and then you're going to basically make it so that it's confined within a region. Well, this cylindrical device ended up being very inefficient. You had to have what we call very strict boundary conditions to be met. Uh, basically, if the particles had given energy or the trajectory wasn't right, you'd have what we call leakage. And so those would escape. And you know, part of what we need in fusion is we need these to be confined together, right? So if you have leakage, then you're not going to have a very efficient system. You're going to end up putting in more energy than you're going to get out. It's not going to be viable for what we want, which is energy production. So not to say that this couldn't be you know, developed further, uh, but this particular method for magnetic confinement really hasn't gone anywhere. The type of magnetic confinement that we're really going to be focusing on um, for this talk is going to be using a tokamak design. And really, that just means that it's a torus, uh, which is a donut, right? And so you can think of this, it doesn't, its boundaries are now going to just be the surfaces of the donut. And it's not going to have that same, um, when you have a cylinder, right, you're still going to have those distinct boundaries at an end. But because we can confine it in a donut, it actually creates for a slightly more efficient system. And so there's a lot of physics that they go into uh, here, but just think of it as this donut shape basically helps reduce the amount of leakage that we're going to experience. And so it has shown the most promising technological design to start achieving this fusion. And so what we do is we inject our radiation, so the different isotopes of hydrogen, into this circle. We're confining it. And so one thing that you also heard about is the amount of time that it can confine it, right? So the longer that, because all of this is a reaction. So we're hoping that one term that came up is the cross section of a reaction. That's really just a fancy way of saying the probability that it's going to occur. So what's the probability of these different isotopes to merge together to undergo this fusion reaction? Because we also saw that there's not just 
deuterium and tritium that can create fusion. You could also have deuterium, deuterium. You could have proton, proton. If you did a little bit more uh, digging, you probably saw that you could do protons and borons and all sorts of other fun combinations to create a exothermic or, or releasing energy from this fusion reaction. Because really that's, that's all that we're doing is we're releasing this. When the energy is released, it's actually released as uh, kinetic energy in the sense of what comes out possesses a speed with it, right? And that speed can be translated to, or a velocity, I should say, but th the velocity can be translated to energy. And that is then used to heat up water, similar to what they do in um, fission reactors. They'll heat that up, will turn some turbines, and then we'll end up getting energy produced that way. We are basically trying to maximize the probability of these reactions occurring, right? Because if the reaction doesn't occur, we don't get any energy out. We don't see a net positive for energy production because we really want to see more energy out than in. And in fact, we want to see there's, there's a specific factor called the plasma power amplification factor. We want to see that greater than 10, which what does that mean? It means that the fusion power, so the output divided by the external uh, heating power. So output over input, basic. There's, there's a little bit more that goes into that, but that's essentially what we want. And so for viable economic energy production, we want to see a factor greater than 10. I, I had a question about that. So what got me interested in, in talking about this was that at the end of last year, I think there was a lot of articles happening about ITER and about like getting out more energy than you put in. And a caveat, I was like, whoa, cool, we're going to have like fusion. It's going to be great. Um, and then a caveat that I found to that was that basically what they were taking into account for inputs was limited. So it was like more energy out than in if you took into account just like the very direct like energy you put in to initiate the reaction. But if you took into account all of the stuff that went into like, you know, you, you need to have we'll get into this, but you need to have a special kind of magnet, um, like a superconducting magnet that needs to be really super cold. And so that takes a lot of energy to keep it really super cold and like you need to have all this other stuff. And so that it still didn't achieve like a total net amount of energy out that would overcome all that. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, it's exactly. So in versus out or out divided by in, you have to really do take into account everything. Um, and I love that you brought that up because there's congressionally mandated this is this is not just, um, you know, this is bigger than the U.S., but in the U.S., we've been having this conversation a lot um, just with respect to the National Ignition Facility and what they can even count as ignition for themselves, because that's absolutely right. You can get out more than the initial energy that you put in, but when you sum all of the different energy that needs to go into confining um, into operating the different portions of the machine. That's what we really are trying to take into account when we say that this is reaching a certain level of output. And so, yes, exactly. We want more out than the total sum of in. I don't know how old that is, but I know the article mentioned that the U.S. abandoned all of its efforts towards the magnetic mirror. Is that one of the reasons those efforts were abandoned? I also... From the article, yes, uh, saw that we abandoned the magnetic mirror. From my understanding was that we, as the United States, have not really pursued fusion as ambitiously as Europe has. And we also help fund some of these projects. Like we are partners in ITER. We've helped fund some of that project. It is likely that, especially with the ignition results from NIF, there may be more interest in pursuing fusion programs in the United States. But I think that at the time, because um, I think it was early 2000s, it just wasn't coming along very quickly. And we were seeing advances in other types of technologies. So while fusion is deemed this golden, amazing uh, energy source of the future, we've seen time and time again that this you know, the principles that they're using here 
have been known about since I, I think it even says the 1950s. It's that this is so challenging to accomplish. And Jamie brought up a very good point. A lot of the technology just to even do some of this, like we need uh, superconducting magnets and we also need very specialized materials uh, and we need a decent amount of rare materials as well just to accomplish fusion. And so all of these compounded, you can see that sometimes people may want to invest in other types of technology. Additionally, there are occupational uh, hazards. Um, as I said, we're, we're very interested in using deuterium and tritium. Uh, tritium is very hard to come by. Um, as we've read, one of the hopes in uh, ITER is to use what's called a lithium blanket. Um, so essentially coat that uh, donut with a blanket of lithium. Then the idea is that because fusion releases neutrons, these neutrons then interact with the lithium, that lithium is called activated, and it then decays into tritium and other uh, products. And then we can harvest that tritium for reuse in the fusion. And this would be a wonderful way to produce what we need to uh, generate this type of reaction. But it's a little more complicated than that, just because one, we're hoping for probabilities. And also sometimes when these reactions happen, we call them branched reactions. So you have different chances for different products to be created. The lithium that is most abundant um, in nature is called lithium-7. Well, lithium-7, when it reacts with a neutron, branches. And so only one of its branches creates tritium. Lithium-6, on the other hand, when it reacts with a neutron, it will produce um, in large quantities tritium. Uh, but lithium-6 is, you know, I think 10% abundant and lithium-7 is about 90% abundant. So we're, we're running into already one issue with fusion, which is just the energy source. And you may say, oh, well, what about deuterium? I read that deuterium can be harvested from salt water because um, deuterium is a more, it's a naturally, one, it's stable, and two, it's naturally occurring. And so we can go through many different processes and harvest deuterium. Well, again, the amount of energy released from a deuterium reaction, uh, deuterium, deuterium, is just going to be less than that of deuterium, tritium. And when you think about the amount of energy and the confinement that goes in, we really want to get the biggest bang for our buck. So we want to have the reaction that's going to release the most energy uh, because it really does take so much energy. Um, superconducting is cryogenic, which means typically uh, cooled down to at least liquid nitrogen temperatures, if not sometimes liquid helium, uh, which are a very, very, very cold. And also just operating using the liquid nitrogen or if you needed to liquid helium, uh, gets to be very expensive as well, right? So can we talk about why we need superconducting magnets and why they need to be so damn cold? This is, and and I will admit, you know, my my expertise is going to be much more in the fundamentals than in the engineering portion of this. But really, we need these superconducting magnets because we need extremely strong magnetic fields. So as I said, we really need to confine this within whatever geometric design we have chosen. So for this, we're talking about the donut. You have to have a very intense, high intensity magnetic field. So remember, we're trying to mimic environments that we see in stars. So we're trying to force these little, basically ping pong balls that are trying to force, you know, the electromagnetic force that they're exerting on one another is re repelling each other. So we really have to, we have to confine it, basically overcome those electromagnetic forces. And so we have to create an extremely strong magnetic field. And why does it have to be so cold? Well, my knowledge of superconducting uh, magnets is simply that their efficiency goes much higher. It's how we get into the superconducting realm which is just a higher level of efficiency than a typical conductor would be. And so it allows us to produce these types of environments that we would need. 
when you're talking about the superconductors, you keep uh, you mentioned the magnetic fields and creating magnetic fields, and I noticed that the differentiating factor um, between the closed confinement systems was the use of the toroidal and poloidal uh, magnetic fields, which I had no idea what it was before yesterday. Um, can you either validate or invalidate? So I also had to look up toroidal and poloidal, um, and it's it's just a basically when we're working in that geometry. We change our units. And so we change the way that we talk about the geometric space, right? So we're very used to Cartesian coordinates, which means X, Y, Z, but the toloidal and polaroidal is basing everything in terms of that torus. And so toroidal, right? That torus shape. Um, and polaroidal, I think, has to do with the polar coordinates, which is typically what you would work with in a sphere. But I, I think that the poloidal is, in fact, even with more reference to that torus shape. And so when we talk about those types of fields, again, it's, it's typically when we convert to different coordinates, right? You still have something in reference to an axis and then typically something in reference to an angle. So it's just talking about how to break up that field with reference to an axis and with reference to an angle off of that axis if that makes sense. And so you'd need that because again, we're not working in a, um, in the cylindrical one, we could talk about it in terms of like the X or Z axis as it would be called, but you know, it's a straight line, but here, since we're constantly curved, it's easier to talk about these things. The math will work out much easier. You can figure out a lot of what you need for the engineering by re reframing your world, right? In order to be in reference to the geometry that you're working with. Okay, thank you. But one thing that we can also talk about with reference to the superconductors is the materials that need to go into them, right? So this is, we kind of touched upon the difficulty of finding the amount of material just to sustain the fusion reactions. Well, these superconducting materials are always being developed, which is why that room temperature one, I'm sure that they were saying, we found this material, we combined different metals of some sort, and they can reach this superconducting realm at room temperature. And so that's yet to really be confirmed. And we still are looking for more efficient alloys and different combinations of metals um, to increase the efficiency even at cryogenic temperatures. I think that we are reading all of the ones that they're currently using also use niobium, which is a rare metal just to begin with. And then they're looking at different alloys of them. I think that they were saying that the next generation might be niobium aluminum alloy, and currently they're using niobium tin. And so materials are just difficult to manufacture. Uh, they're also very brittle, as the review was saying. And as you can imagine, when we're in a donut shape, we, we need curvatures. And so uh, you don't always need that for the magnets, but when you want to optimize geometries, you don't always want to have to be restricted to something that's so firm. Um, so having something more malleable would be beneficial. Again, not being from the engineering side, I think that it really is ideal to not only have something that is just good for superconducting, but we also want it to be cheaper itself because we don't want to have to go through this very strenuous process of creating this extremely expensive, hard to find material, uh, especially if the idea is to use this as an energy source of the future. Because if no one can afford to make these reactors, then no one's going to use this anyways. It's a problem that we see with all sorts of alternative energy sources. Now, even when we look at um, renewables, we still don't see those being implemented everywhere because the materials to obtain those renewables can be very difficult or the upkeep can be very difficult. And so the same would be true for this fusion reactor. You know, as we explore this, ITER is kind of nice because it is really just for research, um, but it is the foundations for hopefully a commercial reactor. And so you would like to use this time as wisely as possible, this time and money. I mean, ITER is already considered billions of dollars uh, over budget. 
it's always being delayed. Um, the article that I think we sent was from 2021. It was saying late 2020s. Now, I think if you look at it, it um, the online date, I've seen variations, but I, I've, the average is about early 2030s. So this is very common in the fusion field as well and kind of goes back to your question, Ryan, why did the U.S. abandon it? I think that until some of the principles of how to you know, robustly reproduce these fusion reactions, it's just not something that the U.S. government has had that much interest in. There are some private groups that will uh, fund fusion, but our programs currently just don't, don't place that same emphasis. Although I have heard that I think the Department of Energy may be restarting some of that. That's kind of just something that I've heard offhand, not not really anything been published about it. I was talking with my friend who uh, works in like nuclear fission plants currently, uh, and he was like, the, the joke about nuclear fusion in the field is that it's always 20 years away. Yes. Yeah, that is the joke. Exactly. Did they have any other types of perspective, especially just coming from fission versus fusion, just the idea of nuclear energy is still very stigmatized, right? Um, especially since 2011 with the Fukushima plant. I think that one thing that everyone is very excited about fusion is that it really produces very minimal waste, like radioactive waste, even though it is very difficult to get the materials to produce this, uh, we want fusion to work because then we don't have these extremely long-lived radioactive waste products. We have like helium-3, and then uh, which really is not all that harmful to us. So, so that's pretty much like the major byproduct of a of a fu- fusion reaction, or like what else does it make? It typically is going to make those helium different isotopes of helium. So, helium three was um, with reference to actually, I think helium three would be two deuteriums. Um, it might even create helium four, which we might call an alpha particle if it doesn't have any electrons. Which I'm just thinking about in terms of when energy is being released. You may read alpha heating, or like an alpha may be heating water. It's the, that's the same as a helium four uh, nucleus. Um, but different isotopes of helium and neutrons are really what we're concerned about. Unless if you were to look at proton and boron, proton plus boron would give you an isotope of carbon after fusing, and so and and the one the one big thing and the one big takeaway is that fusion produces neutrons, right? So fission requires neutrons and fusion produces neutrons. And so you can see that there's a lot of applications by something that is producing these neutrons because neutrons can be used to, and I used this term earlier, but activate other elements and materials. So that lithium blanket is activated by the outcome, the burst of neutrons that come out. Fusion neutrons are also what we consider high energy neutrons. They're 14 mega electron volts. And so those are considered, it's actually good that they're at that high energy for the specific reaction of creating tritium out of lithium seven. But we also have to worry a little bit about the production, the production of these neutrons because neutrons have a great ability to pass through materials, right? Because they basically have to come into contact with a nucleus um, in order. And, and not just that, but they, as they're passing through something, I'm doing this because particles can always be thought of as waves, right? Not always, but we can talk about particles in terms of waves. And what we say with neutrons is that, you know, the waves of that neutron have to be able to undergo a probabilistic reaction with whatever they're passing through. High energy ones can go through different amounts of material. So can low energy, but low energy are also more likely to be um, captured by a nucleus. But if those neutrons escape out of the system, you know, if we're producing very high outputs of energy, you might think those neutrons are getting just, you know, by probability, more are going to be releasing from the system. Um, the occupational health and safety of workers at fusion plants might be more concerned about what we call neutron dose. So, you know, neutrons can interact with your body. And there's 
only so much shielding that you can do from a neutron. We always talk about in radiation safety as low as reasonably um, appreciable, so Alara. So we want to minimize um, our, you know, how much we are exposed to different types of radiation. The more amount of neutrons coming out of this, the more we might be concerned about occupational health. Um, but that's something that, again, ITER being the research um, platform is going to help hopefully um, collect some of that data so that we know how to safely and economically operate a fusion reactor. Because I just want to always emphasize the safety aspect of all of this as well, because neutrons are very finicky. And because they're, because, you know, a neutron is about the same size as a proton, it's a little bit bigger. But because of that, it can knock around and it can displace things. It can be absorbed. When it's absorbed, that's the activation. Uh, typically, it creates an unstable isotope of an element, and then that will decay. They have amazing destructive abilities. As great as they are, um, they can also destroy quite a bit. So we always want to be careful when working with neutrons. And I think that was one of the things that was mentioned in the challenges of the materials um, for Eater, right? Was um, the plasma facing materials uh, of the, the yeah. reactor, right? Yes, that's, that's absolutely right. Um, and I think that they were saying that the way that Eater is designed is such that I, I forget the exact term they were using, but it's, oh, displacements per atom. So because these neutrons are bouncing around, knocking things, um, and, you know, we're using a lot of uh, materials that typically are in a lattice. So a lattice, you know, will be very well organized. That's always important. And typically it's part of their properties is that you need to be in this lattice to function the way that we want. So you need to be in this nice lattice, but if a neutron comes banging around, um, it's gonna knock some of these out of their placement, which can lead to degradation of the material. And again, if we have an extremely expensive material, um, one thing that they brought up was a radiation hard material. That means that it's going to be resistant, uh, probably less of those displacements per atom than other materials. And I think that they were saying that ITER is about 10 DPAs, or the materials used in ITER is about 10 DPA. They're guessing that more commercial reactors will be as high, and, and the demo fusion reactor, which is brought up, which is also in that tokamak design, will be using materials that have higher DPAs, which really means that you could see the machine needing either more maintenance or could have a higher chance of going down unplanned downtime, as we might say. And so that that's a big deal because, again, when you're looking at this from the commercial angle, you never want unplanned downtime. So, yeah, the, the material gain and choosing all of this, and you, you have to balance it between something that's going to be radiation hard, but also extremely efficient, that is economically feasible. And then you also lump in the cost of what it takes to power that as well. Uh, back to Jamie's original point of powering superconducting magnets is extremely expensive. And it's a confluence of many different difficulties and high price tags, which is why uh, fusion has, you're always going to see that 20 years in the future. There's never enough money <laughs> in the present. It's also why the, the ETER is like a collaboration of like 15 different countries or something or, or more. <laughs> yes, because because they needed the um, investments. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I mean, this is a very elementary question. Um, and it was just something that I caught when I was reading through. And it was talking about DT reaction to, uh, requiring a lower mass. And then in table two, I was reading just the number portion, right? The mass numbers and noticed that it was 350 compared to coal which was 2.7 and i was trying to i spent 15 seconds trying to figure out why 350 was smaller than 2.7 but i noticed that the authors used different units of measure and i'm sure there's a completely logical explanation so like coal is measured in met tons and dt reaction is measured in kgs is there is there a reason that they're measured differently in the table my guess is that this is this is my best guess is that when you're combining working from these different industries, you have ind industry standards. 
one one thing that may have been helpful that they could have done would have been a unit conversion between all of this for easier comparisons. But as you pointed out, you are working megatons versus kilograms, and and we're even working in different unit systems um, because a ton, I well, you can always convert between them, uh, but tons I think is in reference to pounds. Two point seven mt um, is. 2,700 kilograms. So so it actually 350 is smaller than 2.7. It just took me way longer um, to realize that there were different units of measure. Uh, yes. And and just as someone who has no experience in nuclear research, I didn't know if there was a reason that they were left in those specific units of measure or not. Again, I think it's probably an industry standard, especially from the coal and oil perspective. I can see why it's reported in megatons, kilograms. I would like to point out, though, that 350 kilograms of deuterium and tritium, while while significantly less than what is needed for any other type, it's still a very heavy mass for when you consider how light these are isotopes of hydrogen, which are minuscule in comparison. It is fair to say that you you do need less, but one thing that they didn't talk about was the ratio of deuterium to tritium. And it's one that I, I didn't particularly look up if it's a 50-50% mixture or if you're going to have a different mixture of deuterium and tritium. And why why might you have not a 50-50 mixture? Well, uh, it's possible that there's some benefit of having an imbalance. Um, again, not 100% sure. My guess would be 50-50, but you need someone who really knew about how the reaction works to get a better answer. But still, when you think about it, you need that much tritium. And, and one thing that we didn't talk about, but has been kind of alluded to in the difficulty of tritium is that tritium is radioactive. Um, and it is mentioned in this article that tritium has what, what's called a half-life of you know roughly 12 years which means in 12 years if we had one kilogram sample we're going to look at about 500 grams after uh 12 years and so just the fact that it is decaying away uh makes it very difficult to obtain tritium also is used in other types of applications so you're competing for this as either fuel or um, other applications of using tritium. We also use it in other types of research. It's used in national defense and all all sorts of competing businesses want tritium. So if you're not getting the tritium from the lithium jacket, like where do people get it from now? We have to generate the lithium or, or the tritium typically. So many different people will undergo these different types of reactions to milk, as we might call it, or create a generator for tritium. Naturally, tritium is created in the ozone layer. So cosmic rays and radiation from the sun passing through the ozone uh, can interact with water, so the hydrogen and water, and naturally create tritium. It's very, very, very small amounts of tritium. So we don't use that. We, We don't rely on that method for any of these productions. We have to generate it ourselves doing some type of nuclear reaction, which is also why it's so expensive just to do this because you're creating a whole new manufacturing stream just for one of the material sources. And so I'm sure when you take that into account, uh, there's probably someone out there who will incorporate that into the cost and overall effective output of a fusion device is the amount of energy that's even needed to produce some of the tritium. If it's not part of the calculation, I guarantee a politician at some point is going to throw it in there. <laughs> you could make the numbers say whatever you want because you could look at the very narrow, you know, direct input versus output. Okay, you could step out and add in like the cost to maintain the superconductors at like cryogenic uh, temperatures. You could step out and be like, okay, what was the cost both in financial terms and in like you know, energy terms to like make this reactor, you could step out and look at what's the cost to 
harvest the materials um, and produce the materials for the superconductor, the materials for the jacket, the, you know, getting the deuterium and tritium from somewhere, it really can spiral outwards. And that's one of the things I was interested in is like how much more efficient and it seems like it's mostly a materials issue like how much better would the materials have to get for this to actually be like environmentally better because like yeah the 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 fusion doesn't produce any co2 or any like other really harmful byproducts other than the the neutrons which is an occupational hazard but I'm sure mining all of the materials to make the superconductors produces a lot of adverse climate effects and produce like making these reactors is very energy intensive and so like how how good does it actually have to get to really like be cleaner oh absolutely i mean and and that's a i think that that's a big argument that a lot of different industries are having especially when we talk about you know even solar panels um the materials to produce solar panels that exact same you know the the mining that goes into getting these materials, sure they're renewable, but actually for how long and how much negative energy impact or environmental impact went into getting the materials to start with. So yeah, that that's a really great point. And the answer is uh, 20 years, right? <laughs> <laughs> 20 years out. The news article that I provided, it really just kind of talks about the difficulty, as we've said, really comes down to materials and um, the functionality of those materials. So obtaining them, making them work the way that you want, and uh, basically being able to confine these different isotopes for a sustained period. And ideally, you'd want to run this reaction for you know a longer period of time um, to produce more energy. And we're currently, I think that this review was saying that at the moment we're able to sustain some of the magnetic confinement for just over a minute. Um, that may have in that may have gone up a little bit. This this review was published in 2018, but I want to say that we're still in you know just a couple of minutes of confinement. And so, if we really want to be able to reach economic um, you know commercial use of this, we're going to have to really bump up our game. Right. I was gonna ask like so what happens does it does the reaction just like what happens when it when it reaches that like minute or a hundred seconds my understanding is that as soon that's basically the amount of time that they're able to confine everything using the magnets so as soon as they can't confine it my guess is that there's some type of exit i didn't read into this as much but you wouldn't want it to just disperse uh again I'm, I'm sure that it just means that it's the end of the confinement. They probably have a way to, you know, any of the material is then pumped out of the donut. And it just means that, that that's the period that you're hoping that these reactions occur. Because again, it's a probability that anything's going. And the closer that you can confine all of this and the higher the pressure and temperature, you know, the chance of the probability of this reaction is going to increase. But and and so the amount of time that it's in these environments means that you have a higher probability of getting energy out and more energy because you you probably will get certain reactions occur. And so like once once a reaction starts occurring, is it kind of like fission where it's like a chain reaction or is it kind of like a big like burst of energy that then like goes away? This is essentially a big burst of energy. So fission is that chain reaction because basically you need a neutron to initiate fission. So a neutron comes into a big atom, it activates that big atom in the same principles that we've been talking about. The big atom then splits off into two different, what we call daughter species. And then they always it typically give off neutrons as well. And these fission fragments, as they're called, you know, they're not really what we're interested in anymore, but those neutrons that come out, they're the propagating neutrons. And so you need moderators in a fission reaction because as you can see, it could get out of hand. And so you need a way to control the fission reaction. But in fusion, we're really just trying to force these little ones together. And those neutrons, we're not really all that concerned about the neutrons interacting with the deuterium or the tritium. In fact, we're 
as we said, we're trying to use them and activate those different blankets of lithium to hopefully generate that tritium for future reactions. So really, you're kind of, if you think about it in the sense of activating the lithium to create more tritium, you're trying to create a sustained reaction, but it's, it's not going to have that, that chain the same way that fission is going to have. One interesting thing, just because we still have some time, right, is the difference between fission and fusion, because you might be thinking, so we have one process where we're combining two different nuclei to generate energy, and we have one where we're splitting apart a nucleus to create energy. And it has to do with that concept of binding energy that I kind of talked, I brought up, but I don't know if I really explained it. But basically, the binding energy within a nucleus, you know, when you have all these protons confined into a tiny little area together, you know, you might be wondering, how do we keep all of these things that are trying to push each other away? Well, one, neutrons help stabilize that. But even when you look at the whole sum of individual neutrons and individual protons, the total combined mass of if you were to break it all apart is typically higher than if you look at what the atomic mass unit of an individual nucleus is going to be. And there's binding energy, so or it's greater than. There's binding energy associated with creating those nuclei. And so there's a binding energy curve, but essentially uh, up to about iron and nickel, we get energy by fusing nuclei together. And then above that, we get energy by breaking them apart. And so that's how we're able to use such complementary processes to produce energy. I was going to say, this is why like, I, I've read that once stars start making iron in their core, that's when they're like sort of at the end of their life cycle because they can't push the irons together to make more things. So they now you're on like limited fuel and it will either die or explode or something. Uh, so it's kind of it's kind of the same idea is that like, yeah, you can only push together the really light stuff to get energy. Yes, that's that's absolutely right. You know, I wanted to know about the complexity of harvesting deuterium. And then maybe a good follow on question for that is it doesn't sound like it's extremely complex and that it's abundant, but is it a costly process? And kind of building on what Jamie mentioned earlier, what's the impact of that process on the ecology of the seed? So deuterium is, and I will have to look this up, it's not super abundant, but it is um, because it is stable, right? Uh, we're able to get, we, we see that in nature. Yeah, the article said it was like 0.1% or something. They're like, so it's super abundant and we've got tons of it. Yeah, so exactly. It is it is 0.0156%. It occurs. And basically, we have a way of when you process this water, uh, you have a way of separating out things that are heavier from things that are lighter. So that one extra neutron ends up helping. We go through these processes. I, just because it can be done and, and it is done, it still ends up being costly. And my assumption is that we are able to harvest out the deuterium. They likely replenish that back into the ocean or they do something. Um, so you're probably not taking too much. You're probably not disrupting the ecology of where you're performing this. Um, it's typically ocean water this is done with. And so I'm guessing that they're replenishing kind of what they're taking. You know, like anything, um, you can probably think of it like a dam or something else. It, it will likely have an impact on the system. It's, it's not going to have the same impact that a dam would, but you are going to probably see, you know, whenever you're funneling something out, and even if you're putting it back in, you're altering how the flow of that, it, it, especially local system. But being that it's from the ocean, I can't anticipate that it would have a huge ecological impact, but I'm sure that there are articles out there and that people are studying that because it's important to know the consequences of our actions. Uh, or hopefully we're starting to learn that it's important to know the consequences of our actions. I don't know if we actually know that. <laughs> and then as Jamie was talking about, um, you were making a joke about building in things or things into the cost of nuclear energy. I was just picturing 
the process of harvesting deuterium belonging to the DAOs or the Union Carbides or Arkimas of the world. And then that just being based on some sort of index pricing um, and just driving up the cost of nuclear fission for the, the common everyday person. It will be interesting if Fusion ends up coming online. If Fusion did come online, it, it would really alter where we get our energy from. So I can certainly see that whoever has the easiest way to produce deuterium and tritium. Tritium is always going to be one where tritium is used for a lot of national security purposes. So we don't actually, um, this, this is kind of a relevant topic for when you think about non-proliferation or you don't want these types of materials everywhere. Um, it's going to be very interesting as we start to become more dependent on some of these. Do we want to see tritium everywhere? even if it is the future for energy, uh, if there are other associated uses of tritium, it's going to become more than just an energy conversation. I think that high production of tritium, even making that much tritium is just going to have more discussion than I think just energy uses. Yeah, the paper actually kept saying like, this is a good like it said peaceful or peaceably like in it a number of times. And I'm guessing that that is, you know, in contrast to nuclear fission, where you see like in Iran, there's a whole discussion about like, are they enriching uranium for energy or are they enriching uranium to make a weapon? But now you're saying like and so they were like, oh, fusion is a great like peaceful use of nuclear energy. And now you're saying that tritium has like national defense uses. So like what are those and how big of a concern is that? Well, tritium is just, well, one, we know that tritium is just a very useful isotope. I'm I'm just going to talk very high level, but it's a very useful isotope of hydrogen. It has the ability to undergo, you know, this high probability of fusion reactions. And that has a lot of potential, as, as much good as it can do, that ability to undergo fusion is also something that we want to be sure that it's not used in a negative capacity. And so all all that I'll say is that with every good, anything nuclear, I always say that it's it's a double-edged sword. There's two two sides to the coin. There's always going to be a side that can be harnessed in a way that would not be beneficial just as much as there's a way to use it in a beneficial way. You know, we wouldn't have a lot of the technologies that we have without learning about, honestly, both, si- both sides of um, the nuclear field. It is just a byproduct of the science that it comes with. That's a very, very <laughs> ambiguous way to just say that I think you can always see that producing this large amount of outbursts of energy, and as we've talked about, the importance of neutrons for many of these different products and safety associated with neutrons, you just want to be sure that we understand what we're doing before we put this out there, right? If tritium all of a sudden starts to become very easy to produce, you just want to be sure that it is going to be used for energy. And and I do agree that there is a peaceful aspect. And the IAEA is all about the peaceful uses of these different radioisotopes. Um, but one thing, and this is this is just on the safety side, the IAEA is a big fan of, not a big fan, but they fund, you know, what we call radioactive sources for medical applications to many different countries. And these are radioactive sources that the U.S. is trying to, re- we're even trying to reduce the number that we have in the U.S. Um, for non-proliferation efforts. So there are peaceful uses of all sorts of technologies and materials, but along with those can always come potential nuclear threats. I did just do a quick Google validation of my knowledge. I know that tritium did have some commercial uses, and um, even with my experience in the military, um, tritium has some very non-nefarious uses. So, for example, like the uh, the glowing paint is a tritium phosphorus mix, right? So it just takes the sun's energy, stores it, and then at nighttime releases the glow. So um, I know that's used in a lot of civilian commercial applications as well. And there are medical applications. We use it as biotracers and 
we do it's called scintillation counting. So because tritium decays, we can count what comes off of it. So it has many useful, again, positive, beneficial aspects in both uh, in industry, medicine, energy, and defense. But yeah, uh, the article did heavily emphasize that this would be, I, I, I agree with the article, it would be much harder to harness the negative aspects, I think, of tritium than it is to harness some of the negative aspects of, say, uranium. It also said that it's a lot less likely for like like much, much, much almost impossible, less likely for a fusion reactor to like explode catastrophically. Uh, why? Why is that? Well, um, I think, again, it it has to do with the mechanism of running the reactor. Right. So in the fusion reactors where we're trying to force these materials together we're, gener- we're, we're generating helium also. That's important. Helium is an inert gas, right? And so we're generating this inert gas as the byproduct of the fusion reaction. We're really not worried about that propagating effect that we see in fission. So we can more easily control this because we turn off the magnet, right? I mean, if you really needed to, you turn off the magnet and they're all going to go flying away from one another, um, which wouldn't be great and would probably have different. You probably have to think about that. And there's probably a lot of thought going into that with ITER about, you know, how would we turn this off in an emergency if we needed to? But in a fission reaction or in a nuclear reactor, fission reactor, you have many different aspects. So you're, you're building up different types of explosive gases in a fission reactor. So that can be very difficult. You have to control that reaction if you don't have, and and controlling fission reactions, uh, again, this is kind of outside of my full knowledge, but just from what I remember, there are all sorts of criticality numbers that you have to keep into account. Um, Your moderators, when you insert and take out your moderators is very important. Um, So there's a lot of mechanistic aspects that go into containing the fission reaction Um, and also the byproducts of fission, right? So not only are you creating these gases, you're creating nuclear waste. And that waste has, if it gets released, it's going to impact the environment around it. So that's why people don't always include nuclear reactors as clean energy because of the nuclear waste that's being produced. Whereas there really is not the same associated waste at all with these fusion reactions. And so we're not, I'm sure that there are, again, those occupational health and safety issues that they're trying to come to terms with and we'll be learning about on ITER, but it's just a different scale than what you're working with in a nuclear fission reactor. Like again, with Fukushima, when that happened and the amount of radiation that then got leaked into the ocean, the response time was also just very, you have very short amount of time to figure it out or do the right thing in a fission reactor if it's melting down or something. Um, and, And I just don't anticipate that you'd probably see those same types of problems in a fusion reactor. And again, you're not worried about the same release of um, hazardous material. And also, like you were saying, it doesn't propagate like a fission reactor does. For a sense of like radioactivity scale, you said earlier that like tritium's half-life is 12 years or something. When I was talking to my friend who works at like fission plants, he was saying that the half-life of the radioactive waste that is produced there is like hundreds of thousands of years to the extent that they're trying to figure out how to make signs that future civilizations will interpret as don't go here. It is. I mean, it is a huge problem where because these radioactive wastes, I mean, every isotope has a different instability, right? And so as you said, hundreds of thousands of years. Uh, I mean, uranium is technically unstable, right? All uranium is unstable, yet we can mine it because it has an extremely long half-life. The U.S. needs to start considering, are we going to create another waste um, repository or are we going to change our nuclear waste policy? Because not every country 
you know, you don't always have to just keep your waste. You can do um, various, you can reprocess the waste essentially and basically allow it so that you can reuse some of that waste. I kind of wanted to come back to the nature of like the fusion reaction and that it's like a big burst of energy and how good are we at like efficiently harnessing that big burst of energy and then because you know people don't just need energy in like a big burst you need it like over time and so how good are we at like storing and releasing that like at a constant rate i think that what we're doing is we're we're converting that energy right so we convert it into mechanical energy so very similar to in nuclear fission reactors which is what happens is we're basically creating steam that turns turbines or we're creating you know different flows to turn turbines and basically converting that mechanical energy and storing that mechanical energy and so we're using very similar principles in a fusion reactor where that burst of energy, remember, is coming off as kinetic energy of particles. And so those particles, when they pass through substances, deposit their energy that heats it up. We then, you know, pass that through different processes and it typically then becomes steam that turns turbine or it's very hot water that then is, you know, turns a turbine to cool down. And so I think that overall we're okay with at least capturing the energy storing the energy is probably going to be something that um they're going to have to work on at some point um especially if you're going to have outputs you know that when we talked about that uh plasma power ampl amplification being you know greater than 10 it's likely going to be a concern just to be sure that you can retain everything or process it. But I think that at the moment, they're more concerned with sustaining the reaction. It is a good thought that this will have to be, you know, set up in regions that have the ability to store large amounts of power. And so having that infrastructure and really thinking about the grids in which you place this is probably going to become more important as this technology becomes more viable. So w when I finished reading the the review article, I was left wondering kind of what does all this mean like practically? And then I came over to the IAEA um, article, which gave me a perfect answer to, to like, you know, one of my questions was how much energy can this provide to people? And there was a statement at, yeah, um, that said a few grams of the reactants of uh, deuterium and tritium could produce enough energy for one person to use in a developed country for 60 years. You know, I guess my question is, are we talking about we just need um, one instance of a few grams of these elements uh, or materials, or are we like pumping deuterium and tritium just to get this one instant of a few grams to to make a reaction to create enough energy for one person? Uh, to last 60 years. Yeah, I also read that statement and I thought it was <laughs> very interesting because I agree it it's not necessarily it is very much back to Jamie's point of saying, you know, how do we convert and distribute <laughs> uh store and distribute this energy? And I think that it's saying that those couple of grams can produce that amount of energy. I don't think that we are at the point that that is how I, I think that they're being very idealistic and they're distilling it into in a future reactor when we have this amount of material, you know, swirling around producing this, we should be able to like, if you do the math, we should be able to sustain someone in a developed country for 60 years. And now it's also saying right now there, there's there's a lot that goes into that statement where i think that they're they're doing a lot to make that statement if that makes it like they're, they're going through a lot of processes in between to make that statement um not to say that i think that it's very good to be optimistic and idealistic about this but i think that it's also hard to say in an ideal world i guess in an instant you know, if you only have a couple of those grams and you're perfectly capturing and converting the energy, then yes. But I don't think that it's in an instant, um, at least if I read it the same way. 
I think that that is a very ideal situation. The way that I was reading it, it seemed like this was the current situation for DT Fusion. So that makes sense. Again, I think that it's if we have that ability to, one, sustain the reaction and remember that we have to get more out than we put in. So we're still really not at that point. Um, we are with other types of fusion, inertial confinement fusion, we're able to get more out than we put in, but we're, we're not really at that commercial level at all with any types of fusion. Not only that, but then we're not going to be able to just supply 60 years of energy. So it, it does really come back to that, the need to store, and you're not doing it for one person, you're doing it for a whole population of people. Just another question I had based on that one statement was, you know, 60, you know, if we look at one person for 60 years or 60 people for one year or 120 people for six months, right, is not a lot of people still. So what is the physical footprint of a reactor? Has, has there been any, any discussion about what the commercialized, the size of a commercialized reactor would be? I haven't seen that. I'm sure that there are groups that are looking into this, especially from the investment standpoint, um, you might be able to find some articles that have more of that math laid out that we were just talking about. How do you calculate the impact on the community from this type of reactor? I think we're still so caught up in making this even work from the science perspective that at least at the operational level, they're not going to start seeing that being talked about in ITER or in DEMO. DEMO might, uh, if DEMO comes online, you know, uh, I think that DEMO was the, again, that, that same type of technology as ITER, but it's supposed to be for commercial uses. And I'm guessing that, or it, it's going to be the DEMO for what might happen uh, for commercial uses. You'll start seeing a lot more of those types of analyses, but I, I haven't seen any. And I think it's just too early. I think that everything that you see right now is based off of the most optimistic results. And we're still, we're still having issues reproducing. You know, across the board, it's hard to reproduce results of fusion. And so until we get that and we really get that level of output, I just don't, I think that anything that you read, you need to really take with you really need to be critical of it <laughs> is all I'm going to say, because I think that they're, they're doing it for investment purposes. They, they want you to buy or invest in fusion. And, it, and that can be great because, you know, without the money coming in, we're, it's going to continuously be 20 years now. For completeness, what is inertial confinement? So inertial confinement fusion is what we are doing in the United States. Um, if you've heard of the National Ignition Facility, it is a high energy density facility. So as we've been talking about, it's that same high energies and high temperatures, pressures, therefore densities uh, that need to be reached in order to undergo these types of reactions. And so what we do is we use these little, basically pellets of deuterium tritium. Um, typically, they're actually encased in something and we shoot a laser at it, we heat up this target, and then the target basically forces, you know, that energy is radiating into the sample. It's heating up the deuterium and tritium. They are able to reach the conditions that they need to undergo fusion. They fuse and then they release energy. That, that's in an instant. And so what we have said is when we say ignition, Ignition has multiple definitions. So this is why I was kind of joking about, you know, a politician might throw something in there. NIF has been able to produce more energy out than in uh, multiple times, but congressionally, they've only met ignition definitions uh, recently. I think it was back in 2022. They were able to get more energy out than the sum of what went in. And there were all these different components of what does that mean? Because Again, NIF is really, you're powering this massive laser, hitting this target. And so you need to take into account everything that goes into that and, you know, placing, getting the sample into the right spot and all sorts of things. And so our inertial confinement fusion, Livermore, uh, Lawrence Livermore National Lab, 
the NIF facility has seen multiple promising results of ignition, and they're continuing to improve both their samples so that they're more likely to get ignition when they do a shot. And they're also trying to increase the energy of their lasers so that, again, you're increasing the probability. More ener- I know that that more energy in, you're putting in a new factor of like, oh, why do you want more energy in? But more energy in actually helps increase the chance that you're going to have these reactions and have them to the levels that you want. And so they're trying to increase that. They're improving their targets. And yeah, we'll see. I think that it's very promising for NIF. And we'll probably start seeing a lot more about the ignition facility, not only reaching ignition, but reaching higher levels of output. And why is that important in terms of energy creation, right? Because these are happening in an instant. We're really just heating these targets and then looking at the effects of what comes out. But that's one really important aspect of these programs that even though we're not going to apply this to energy per se, we can study a lot of those radiation effects and you're still combining deuterium and tritium and you're creating fluxes of environments that we're going to see in a magnetic confinement uh, fusion reactor. I think that it has a lot of really great research applications that anyone that wants to do these other types of fusion uh, reactors can learn from and do some interesting uh, preliminary experiments to learn a lot about how to operate even devices that have to deal with that type of energy output. Yeah. So NIF then is like less a thing to generate energy and more a like research tool that's designed to capture the most information about what's going on. Correct. Um, At the moment, NIF was really just created to basically say we can produce ignition. And and now we have. And I think that inertial confinement fusion, it would take a lot of engineering and design to create a system to produce energy out of that. The geometry is just that, you know, you have that, again, that small target, as opposed to this big ring where we're kind of, um, we're more easily able to control that system and just the outputs that are coming out of a magnetic confinement system, it's not a, and and also when we burst these targets, you know, they're happening at extremely fast timescales. When we, when we're like, oh no, we, we only have like, you know, one to two minutes in our, (laughs) in our donut. I mean, this is happening all, you know, sub second. And so it's like, it's just very different. And so converting that into energy versus having a sustained reaction the sustained reaction is, or reactions that are occurring, are really what we want. And it's a much easier way to capture that energy that's being released to convert it into useful energy. I was like, well, why, if we've gotten ignition with this one type and not the other type, why are we still like so focused on the other type? And it's just like, it's completely different like applications. And just that the, those time scales. I mean, looping it back to the question from earlier, but it really is about, oh, well, how, how would we harness that energy? And I think that having it over even just tens of seconds to hundreds of seconds makes it much easier to capture and work with the released energy than those sub-second. It would just be a very different program and very different research and engineering than what I think NIF was even set up to do. Maybe with NIF reaching ignition, big DOE is going to want to start, you know, utilizing some of the results they're seeing there to pick up more of their fusion, magnetic confinement fusion type facilities. And they might be way more interested in combining results from different facilities to really move the science forward. I think that gave a little bit more context for some of the things that were missed in the review paper. I feel like whenever you talk about fusion, and this is why even when starting, it's like, okay, we're talking about magnetic confinement. And it is that small caveat that whenever you talk about one, you kind of have to talk about the other because they even mentioned the third, which is a gravitational, right? Like you can have gravitational fusion. That's what the sun does. It's always interesting to think about the different ways that we can produce these high energy density 
environments and the applications that comes along with producing them in that way. And I very much appreciated that. And I appreciated that it went over even the older designs of magnetic confinement and kind of how did we even come to the geometry that we did. And it's simply because to maximize the efficiency of these rare materials that we need to even produce the reactions. And then also just um, the operational costs, you want to minimize leakage, how we ended up in a donut shape. To me, it definitely seems like even though there are programs that are continuing with the other geometries that this Taurus or the Tokamak is definitely the most promising. I did think that's interesting. And you mentioned the sun that we're trying to recreate what's happening on the sun or in stars, right? And part of the benefit of the sun is it has like just, I can't even imagine how many poles it has because of how, you know, the, the sun operates just to stabilize the plasma. And looking at the, the figures of some of the confined um, systems, how it looks like it gets closer and closer to recreating the amount of poles or trying to recreate you know, a large number of poles with the, like the toloidal and poloidal, uh, polaroidal uh, fields. So I thought that was really interesting seeing how not only are we just trying to recreate what's happening on the sun here on earth with what we have, but it's starting to kind of look like that in a physical form almost. I, I can definitely picture like what you're saying. Yeah, it, it really does feel like, and I always like to just think of it as like a swirling kind of mixture and i whenever i think of the sun or you see like pictures of the sun it's the same like that fluid dynamic um that's occurring in those plasmas and it is it is just fascinating kind of to take a step back and think about that how do they insulate because like the plasma is super hot and the magnets are super cold and so how the, you know, I'm sure there's another like huge materials engineering problem in insulating one of those things from the other one. And again, this is this is mostly just based off of um, that little bit of background. But that is a great point where they they said this in the article, I think just one line, but they're like, the plasma cannot touch the sides of the chamber. As, <laughs> so as soon as the plasma touches the sides of the chamber, chamber, right, you're creating thermal contact. And so I think that what you really want is you're not just confining the plasma. I mean, thermally, you're also concerned about containing that. And I'm sure that there is some thermal radiance that they have to take into account. But that was part of when they were talking about the different materials that they're using uh, to create those. I think it was the niobium titanium strands um, for the toroidal field coils. And then the niobium tin strands for different parts of the uh, overall geometry. I think that they were discussing the importance that those don't get, right? Because those are part of the uh, superconductors. And so they really need to have very specific material properties that they're going to be able to be used in these geometries and still operate the way that they want. Which is something that we kind of, we, we talked about when we talked about the difficulties of all the materials, but it is very complicated to find that balance between having materials that can do what you want and withstand the heat, the radiation that's coming out of it. And that you don't want to replace too often because they're already difficult to manufacture and they're difficult to find materials. And then I think if I remember correctly, that was the shortcoming of the torus, right? Or that donut, which was the original, was that the magnets are just driving this plasma around. And because you can't control it or confine it within the donut, it was touching the walls. So then that's when they introduce the polaroidal magnetic fields. So kind of these spirals around the donut that help confine the plasma away from the walls as it was going around the donut. Yes. Yeah. Basically, um, anything to help minimize thermal contact exactly that thermal contact or any leakage because again the leakage would also probably um cause thermal discrepancies as well in the system and yet like the neutrons are kind of allowed to hit the the sides because that's then how you you make the tritium the lithium yeah and and i mean it's funny because the allowed it's like we we really can't do much about the neutrons because we kind of just 
have to let them um, go out. There are ways to what we call moderate neutrons and slow them down, capture them in other materials. Uh, that's kind of how we try to like contain a neutron. But yeah, we we have to really find those clever ways to just utilize the fact that they're there because we have to have them. Um, but we also want to find a way to use them before they do something that we don't want them to do. I guess if I had a question, it would be next steps, right? So as someone who was just very recently introduced to com- magnetic confinement and thermonuclear energy, just as somebody on kind of a, a high level, if I wanted to look for resources, just beyond Google or whatever, is there something for someone who's not in academia to read up more on this um, in a way that they can understand? I think that, well, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which is uh, who published the article that I sent out, they have a lot of great resources on what is fusion, how does fusion work. Many of the inertial confinement fusion labs in the United States, so Lawrence Livermore National Lab, um, is going to have resources on what is fusion. And they write these, you know, again, bringing it back to that scientific communication standpoint, they want people who don't necessarily know a lot about fusion to come to them with these questions. I think ITER has a website, um, if I recall, and you can learn about magnetic confinement fusion there. There are really great YouTube lectures, probably significantly better than what I said, (laughs) that can break down some of the principles of fusion as well. Um, But if you want to really get into magnetic confinement fusion, just by looking up and going to some of these websites of these reactors that we've been talking about, these uh, research reactors, a lot of them have those initial to the public, how does this work? And almost all of them will start with, we're trying to recreate what happens in stars. So yeah, it will It will all come back to that. I wanted to read the um, first uh, paragraph of the um, IAEA article that you sent because it was hilarious. Uh, So this article starts out 500 years ago, the Aztec civilization in today's Mexico believed that the sun and all its power was sustained by blood from human sacrifice. Today, we know the sun, along with all other stars, is powered by a reaction called nuclear fusion. Yes, (laughs) it's it's quite the opening statement, right? We we don't need human sacrifice to, (laughs) to get the energy of the sun. Yeah, I guess like to wrap up, I would be very interested in like similar to Ryan's question, but like for Daniel, like where do you think the field is going in the next five years? And then for Ryan, like what kinds of things would you be interested in learning more about with nuclear fusion? In the next five years, I think that what we're hoping for is getting closer and closer to either being online. And what is that? really mean? Well, that probably means that both construction and, you know, of these new types of uh, engineering designs, producing enough materials of what they need uh, is going to be a big part of the next five years for them. And I also think that from the other point, uh, which was when we were talking about ignition, I think that we're going to start seeing a lot more about how we can learn and utilize some of those results to help influence um, some of those occupational and uh, operational needs that a magnetic confinement fusion facility might need to take into consideration. Um, First, I'm just thankful uh, to both of you. Now I have a little bit of context when I see anything pop up on my screen about ITER or um, any of the, the related research. So I've actually learned quite a bit. But going forward, things that I would like to learn for me is just some of some more of the practical aspects of it. It's hard for me to believe that so much time and money has been spent researching nuclear fusion as the gold standard of of energy and then being so close with ITER, right? And you know, I'm thinking comparatively close to where we were in 1950. I have to think that there's been some thought into looking at what the the infrastructure of um, a power plant uh you know, would look like for nuclear fusion. So I, I would be interested in learning more about that. Yeah. And sim- similarly, I think that's like really important. And I would be interested in like, you know, if this is going to be the, you know, clean energy of the future, how are we going to not only make like 
sourcing the materials sustainable, but how are we going to distribute it to like the global community, you know, outside of just thinking about first world countries and our own particular energy needs? Yeah. And I just want to say thank you again for having me um, to come talk to you guys. And this has been a really stimulating discussion. So very much enjoyed. For sure. And before we go, um, we'll start with Daniel and then Ryan. Do you have anything to promote? Where can people find you on social media? Um, actually, I do want to make the statement that all opinions that I made were my own and do not reflect either my current employer or past employers. I do photography uh, as a hobby. So if you're interested in photography of all types, photojournalistic, portrait, landscape, um, I could be found on Instagram. Uh, at Ryanzo, R-Y-A-N-Z-O Perez, P-E-R-E-Z. Great. I can I can vouch that um, Ryan takes great photographs. So I think with that, we're going to conclude this super interesting discussion about nuclear fusion. I have been joined by expert Daniel Mulrow and guest Ryan Perez, and we've been discussing two papers. The first was... Uh, Magnetic Confinement Fusion, a Brief Review by Xuanzhen Wang and Lai Feng Li. And the second was a article on the International Atomic Energy Agency called What is Fusion and Why is it so difficult to achieve? Our music is by Sam Brunwasser. You can find more of his work at soundcloud.com slash visualsnowbeats. As always, you can download the paper and read the transcriptions at inplainenglishpod.org. And make sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Plain English Sci. That's P-L-A-I-N-E-N-G-L-I-S-H-S-C-I. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time for another episode of In Plain English.